we should move to the next speaker, which is uh, Jun Lee. Uh, let me introduce him. He's a recent graduate, very recent graduate student from the Department of Mathematics at Princeton. He's done theoretical research in quantum uh, speed limits, and he's gained interest in variational quantum algorithms and the corresponding optimization landscapes. And he will talk about the world's favorable landscapes in quantum combinatorial optimization. So welcome, Jun, and the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. Again, my name is June, and I want to thank you all for having me here today. Um, before I begin, I want to thank Alicia McGon, Christian Arendt, and Hirsch Rabbits for, for working on this project with me, which we actually recently posted to the archive. And for some context, and I guess also a bit of a plug, this project was also the basis for my mathematics thesis this past year, which I've also posted to the archive as a slightly longer and sort of more mathematical version of the actual paper. So most of what I'll be talking about today is from at least one of these two versions. Now, the broad topic that I'll be talking about is variational quantum algorithms, or VQAs, and specifically their use in solving the common control optimization problem called max cut. Now, in general, VQAs are also called hybrid quantum classical algorithms because they use both classical and quantum resources to minimize a given class function, similarly as in the setting of quantum logical control. So VQAs have been studied pretty heavily the past few years, ever since the QAA and other similar algorithms were introduced back around 2014, but most of them have seemed to focus on this sort of quantum side of EQAs. So today, I'll be talking mainly about how to make the classical side easier. So instead of viewing VQAs broadly as a hybrid algorithm, we can make that a bit more explicit by viewing it as a classical algorithm that uses a quantum oracle to provide these sort of cost function evaluations, which I guess thinking back now is sort of similar to what Jared was talking about. Um, and since usually when people talk about quantum advantage, they want something super polynomial, the overarching question I wanted to ask was whether you could say p equals np relative to some quantum oracle A, where A is related to a family of scalable ansatz A. And yes, here both the oracle and the ansatz are labeled with a different sort of form of A on purpose since they're closely related. Now, once you have the setup, you can focus on the classical side of the optimization, where what matters most is the optimization landscape structure. So our overall goal is to design a class of ansatz that can efficiently solve the maxup problem for a non-trivial class of graphs and the way it would do that would be by yielding a favorable optimization landscape. So because we only have about 20, 25 minutes, I'm gonna go through the next few slides pretty quickly, since I'm assuming most people here are somewhat familiar with VQAs and the math problem. But just to get on the same page in terms of notation, here we're trying to minimize a cost function J that is parameterized by some vector theta of real values, where the cost function is given by the expectation of some problem Hamilton in HP with respect to a quantum state psi which is created from the initial zero state on a parameterized quantum circuit, which is defined by some ansatz A. And from the oracle setting that I mentioned earlier, a quantum oracle A outputs a value of J at unit cost, and then gives these values to a classical algorithm that updates the parameters until convergence is achieved, or at least hopefully convergence is achieved. Now, the problem a lot of the time is that the optimization problem is not convex. So in general, this leads to local optima that makes solving the problem pretty difficult. Now, I'm gonna apologize in advance if the wording is a bit confusing, but even though we're solving max cut, we actually encode that as a minimization problem, which is why here, I'll explicitly define a local minimum to be a critical point with a positive semi-definite Hessian that's neither the global minimum or a saddle. Now, given this, when we talk about a favorable landscape, we mean one that is free from bad local optima. And the reason we can usually afford to neglect saddles is that numerical and analytical studies have suggested that even first order gradient algorithms don't have too much trouble avoiding saddle points. And of course, the details for this are kind of complicated and also connected to this barren plateau issue, which I can probably touch on a bit later. But for now, we can focus our attention to a favorable landscape, which corresponds to a powerful oracle, as being one that can remove local optima. Now, in general, since the cost function takes a pretty complicated form, it's hard to analytically compute the gradient and the Hessian elements that you would need in order to provably guarantee that there's no local optima. And this is why we decided to specifically focus on solving the max cut problem, which I'll quickly introduce now again. So basically for max cut, you're given a weighted graph and you want to cut the vertices into two disjoint subsets, such that the sum of edge weights across the cut or the cut valve, which I'm going to call, is maximized. Now in classical optimization, this is usually formulated as a binary quadratic minimization program, where the VAs are either plus or minus one, depending on which side of the cut you're placing the vertex A. As an optimization problem, max cut is both NP hard and APX hard, which basically means that getting any arbitrarily good approximation ratio is also very hard. Now it's also well known that max cut is equivalent to finding the ground state of the Ising-Hamiltonian HP that encodes the graph G, 
which means that assuming that your on dots can reach the ground state, max cut is also equivalent to minimizing the expectation of HP over quantum states created by your parental quantum circuit. Now, as a quick side note, one of the things we can know from this formulation is that we don't actually need the oracle to evaluate J on a parental quantum circuit. It could theoretically just compute it directly without the use of a quantum device. Now, in general, this is pretty hard to do. And one can show that whether or not the cost function is easy to directly compute classically is related to this barren plateau issue that I mentioned earlier. But anyway, what we want to do for our purposes here is to give an analytical form for J. And one of the reasons Maxwell is good for doing this is that the eigenstates of HP are easy to write down. They're just the states corresponding to bit string Z, where each bit has either the eigenvalue plus or minus one. And here you can also see that each eigenstate corresponds to a cut of the graph, where you can split the vertices in the cut by whether the associated bit is a zero or a one. Now, given this setting of solving max cut using a parent quantum circuit, it was recently shown, actually, I think earlier this year, that if you have an on dot consisting only of the single qubit poly x rotations, solving the max cut problem using this circuit is empty hard with the reason being the presence of local optima in the optimization landscape. Now, intuitively, this makes sense for a couple of reasons. The first is pretty easy to show that the cost function takes this form, which is really similar to the classical maxwell formulation that I presented a few slides ago, except you replace the VAs, which were either plus or minus one, with cosine values, which are between negative one and one. And since the classical version is actually MP hard, it makes sense intuitively that this version is as well. Of course, the actual proof isn't as hand wavy as this, and both the original paper by Biddle and Clash, as well as my thesis, give two somewhat different rigorous proofs. But in any case, the intuition is still true. Now, another way you can interpret the classical on dots is by noticing that since the poly x operator acts on basis state by flipping the bits, by turning the zero state to the one state and vice versa, the algorithm is equivalent to trying to find the max cut by iteratively flipping bits. And for a final intuition, most people, and I've actually seen this explicitly in recent PQA papers, associate quantumness with entanglement. So it makes sense that since single qubit gates can create entanglement, that this circuit wouldn't be able to provide a quantum advantage. And so we can call this on dots a classical on dots, and I use that in quotes here, and ask whether or not you could add multi-qubit operations that create entanglement in order to help get rid of the local optima. So now I'll be introducing a class of on dots e, which we call the x on dots, that we use to try and remove these local optima. Now, before I define the on dots itself, I want to list a few features that I would want it to have. And I guess, spoiler alert, our exon dot does have these features. Now, first, one of the reasons you could easily show that the classical on dots gave an explicit form of the cost function was because the on dots elements all commuted with each other, since tensor products of poly x's and identities obviously all commute. So you could actually write down the expectation pretty easily. So we want our on dots elements to also commute with each other. Second, we want our elements to create entanglement so that we can actually have something quantum also in quotes. And lastly, we want to be able to guarantee that we can reach the ground state, but also have our on dots be scalable. So ideally, we want the size of the on dots to scale polynomially. Now, given these conditions, we can define the x on dots here as including h sub j's, those are the Hamiltonians, that are the tensor product of local x operators on some set of vertex subsets defined by a. And just to give an example, the classical on dots that I showed before is an x on dots with a being defined by the set of singletons 1 through n. Now, given an arbitrary x on dots, one benefit is that since, as I mentioned, the elements all commute with each other, you can show that the gradient and Hessian elements take a pretty simple form. And also, you can pretty easily show that any parameter configuration theta that corresponds to an eigenstate of HP, meaning it's a bit string state, has every gradient element being zero. So all eigenstates are critical points. And since now we have a set of critical points, to study the landscape structure, we want to somehow identify all the remaining critical points and classify all of them as being either local optima or saddles. And along these lines, we can show a few preliminary results. And first, our, I guess I call it lemma one, which is given that any x on dots defined by A, any critical point not corresponding to an eigenstate of HP is necessarily a saddle. Now, honestly, proving this level is probably the hardest part of this entire project. But even though admittedly some of the trips are pretty clever, it was mainly just computations and rewritings and doing a bunch of casework on these Hessian elements. But I did add a slide at the end of this talk giving a proof outline if it's worth showing. But Anyway, the good part about this lemma is that it allows us to focus on the eigenstates of HP, each of which corresponds to a cut of the graph. Now, before, I mentioned that solving max cut using the classical on dots was basically equivalent to trying to find the max cut by iteratively flipping bits. The quantumness of a generic X on dot basically allows us to flip multiple bits at a time. So intuitively, we should be able to do somewhat better than just flipping one at a time. 
So given that we can focus solely on eigenstates, which we already know are critical points, we want to directly calculate the Hessian, which will allow us to then classify the eigenstate as being either local optima or saddles. Now, before I state the next lemma, I just want to quickly introduce the notation for the disjunctive union of two sets A and B, which is equivalent to the XOR operation if you were to label the sets in bit string representation. So basically, if you have a particular cut CS and you apply an X on that element to HK, you basically flip each bit in HK and you get CS XOR with HK. Now, using this notation, what this next lemma says is that at a parameter configuration corresponding to an eigenstate CS, the Hessian is diagonal. And the kth diagonal element is given by the difference of the cut fails associated with CS and CS XOR with HK. And what this allows us to observe is that in order for a particular eigenstate CS to be a local minimum and therefore have a positive semi definite Hessian, you need the cut fail of CS to be at least the cut fail of any eigenstate you can reach by flipping the bit of one on that element. And this observation gives us our first theorem which is that the optimization landscape associated with an X on dot consisting of all to the n minus one minus one non-symmetric vertex subsets has no local optima. Where by non-symmetric, I mean the ones that correspond to non-equivalent cuts. So basically you start with two to the n possible vertex subsets on an n vertex graph. And since the cut of S is the same as the cut of S complement, since it's just like the opposite, you can divide by two to get two to the n minus one. And since the identity element is irrelevant, you get two to the n minus one minus one. I think one of the cool things about this theorem is that the proof is actually pretty simple. So I'm going to actually go through the case for the local minima, since the case for local maxima is equivalent. And also I mentioned before that for a problem like max cut, local maxima is sort of irrelevant. So by lemma one, we already know that the only possible local optima correspond to eigenstate of HP. So now assume that there exists some local minimum CZ that is not the global minimum. And let CG be the cut corresponding to the ground state and therefore the global minimum. Now, since we have all non-symmetric project subsets in our ansatz, Let's pick HK to be CZ XOR with CG. Then from the observation before that if CZ is the local minimum, we have that the cut value of CZ is greater than or equal to the cut value of CZ XOR with any other on element. In particular, we can choose that element to be HK. And if you do the calculation, that just simplifies to being the cut value of CG, which is a contradiction because we know CG has the highest cut value and CZ was not the global minimum. And therefore, CZ cannot exist, but the only local minimum is the global minimum. And what this theorem tells us is that an ansatz with exponentially many elements, and so having exponentially many variational parameters, has a landscape that's free of local optima. Now, this is pretty cool, since similar results have been shown in the second quantum algorithm of control that I mentioned before, and also in classical neural networks, which I've also prepared an extra slide on to touch upon later if people are interested. But anyway, what this means is that a first order gradient algorithm that can avoid saddles will converge to the optimal solution. Of course, the bad part is that this would take exponential time since there are exponentially many parameters to vary over. So the natural question then is to ask whether we can solve max cut on some non-trivial class of graphs using a polynomial size exon dots. Now taking a step back, when I first started this project last fall, I didn't actually start with theorem one or any of these previous lemmas. What I did is I first looked at small examples and see if I could find any patterns. One such example was the Ising chain with nearest neighbor interactions, which has this following form. And for this HP, plugging in values for the form of the Hessian in lemma two yields that the classical on dots has local optima, but this particular X on dot, which is linearly sized in the number of qubits and also uses multi-qubit operators, is free of local optima. And basically, you can think of this on dots as starting from one end of the chain and then iteratively adding elements along that chain. Now, of course, solving max cut on a chain is trivial even classically, since the max cut is achieved by selecting every other vertex in the chain, which lets you select all edges as part of the cut, which is obviously the max cut. So the question I would ask was whether you could find a non-trivial class of graphs where the landscape would be free of local optima for some X on dots. Now, unfortunately, as I was testing different graph classes to try for a couple of weeks, I ended up realizing and then proving this next theorem, which is that for any graph G and any X on dots A, there exists a purely classical algorithm that uses resources that scale with the size of A and which has the same solution set as a set of local optima you would have if you were to use the on dots A in the BQA formulation of that step. Now again, if it would be interesting, I've also prepared an extra slide later to go through the explicit construction of this algorithm, which I personally found pretty interesting, but I guess isn't really relevant to the underlying story. But anyway, what this theorem gives us is that since max cut is NP hard, unless P equals NP, there does not exist a class of polynomially sized exon dot Z that yields a landscape free of local optima for generic graphs. And basically you can show this by showing the contrapositive, by saying it, that if there were polynomially sized exon dots yielding a landscape free of local optima, this algorithm would only have the global minimum as its solution set 
meaning a purely classical algorithm would find the global minimum using polynomial many resources, which would mean p equals mp, which is a sort of contribution. And similarly, since max study is also HPX hard, for any polynomially sized exon sets, even an algorithm that can escape saddle points cannot provide a super polynomial quantum advantage over purely classical approximation schemes. We can define the approximation ratio alpha as being the ratio between the cut value that your algorithm will output and the real max step value. Now, going back to the oracle setting that I mentioned before, what this also tells us is that for an oracle corresponding to a polynomially sized exon size, if p does not equal np, and p with the oracle a also does not equal np. Now, this is a line that I'm going to steal from my archive paper because I found it pretty catchy, but this begs the question what exactly is required for a parenthesis quantum circuit to provide a quantum advantage? Now, as I mentioned before, most people would say something like entanglement as the answer, but we've just shown here that the exon dots, even while creating entanglement, cannot provide a quantum advantage. What we realize is that simply having entanglement alone would not likely be enough, and you would also need to introduce non commutativity Now, of course, this phenomenon has also been seen in similar settings, such as the Clifford Gates or IQP circuits, which Jared here helpfully pointed out while we were writing this paper. Now, anyway, based on this, I came up with this conjecture, which I still don't know if it's true, but I suspect it to be the case. Namely, that a parameterized quantum circuit can provide a provable quantum advantage only if the ansatz contains non-commutative elements that also create entanglement. Now, of course, once you have non-commutative elements, it's hard to analytically compute the class function and also the gradient and the Hessian elements. So to test this conjecture, we need to run a series of numerical experiments. So for each of our numerical experiments, what we did is we tested complete graphs Kn with positive edge weights and average the approximation ratios we obtained from 100 different random realizations of the edge weights and also the parameter initializations, and then use standard BFGS algorithm to update the parameters. Now for these experiments, we define the K body that D of a particular exon dots to be the largest vertex subset that an on element would non-trivially act on. So for our first experiment, we consider testing the effect of increasing D by successively adding all n choose k k body operators, where you start from all single qubit terms, then adding all two body terms, then all three body terms, and so on and so forth. And the figure here, you can first see a circuit that depicts this sort of increase in k body depth. And below that, a graph of approximation ratios for different depths d and system sizes n. Now, the first thing we can observe is that when you have exponentially many parameters, namely m equals 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1 from the theorem before, the approximation ratio seems to be very close, if not equal to 1 meaning BFGS converge to the local minimum. And next, you can also see that having a K body depth of D equals one, which is the left column here, means you have the classical ansatz. And already the approximation ratio is pretty high at around 0.97. We can also see that after that, there's an immediate dip in the approximation ratio until you add sufficiently many elements. Now, honestly, I still don't exactly know why this happens, but what it likely implies is that blindly adding an entangling gates doesn't immediately improve your approximation ratio which is why we decided to next try and add in non-commutative ansatz elements, as sort of suggested by the conjecture that I mentioned before. Now, similarly to the QA way setting, which I'll actually be introducing on the next slide, we can add in non-commutativity by alternating between elements from the X ansatz and elements that don't commute. And we can test this by doing it in two different ways, namely by either having the non-commutative element repeat the structure of the X ansatz element, except by replacing the poly Xs with poly Zs, or by fixing the non-commutative element as a global Z rotation. And the top two figures here sort of define these two different ansatz which we call xz ansatz since they include both poly x and poly z operators. And the figure on the bottom shows the approximation ratios for n equals eight qubits. Yeah. And you can see that both ansatz perform better than the commutative x ansatz, but that both of them also show this sort of slight dip in the approximation ratios. And so to go beyond this simple non-commutativity addition and to possibly get rid of this dip, we then decided to also compare these with QA way which, as we probably all know, is a standard way to introduce non-commutativity into an ansatz. A QA way was actually one of the first variational quantum algorithms introduced back in 2014 and had the repeating form as we see here, where the ansatz actually consisted only of two different elements, namely the problem Hamiltonian HP and a global rotation HX, which has a very similar form to adiabatic quantum computation. Now for QA way, similarly as an adiabatic, you have the initial state being the plus state instead of the zero state, since that was the ground state of the X HX Hamilton. Now, for the purpose of our experiment, we tested the X and XZ on dot Z with three variants of QA away. The original one, the one by replacing the single global rotation with N independent local rotation, and one by taking the replaced QA away and also changing the initial state to zero, as in our X on dot setting. And what we can see in this figure is that the X and XZ on dot Z, which are the orange and green curves, 
have much higher starting points than the original QA way or the QA way with local rotations, which are the yellow and blue curves, which are in fact the ones with the plus initial state. Now, as people have seen in similar experiments from other papers, these two variants of QA way don't start very high, but also don't have this dip, and they converge monotonically to high approximation ratios. However, the interesting case we found was in the last variant, where we had modified QA way by adding in these local rotations and also changing the initial state to zero as an exon dot. Now, since the classical exon dots alone had a pretty high approximation ratio with the initial state zero, and the original QA way converged pretty quickly, you could intuitively think that somehow combining the two, as in this modification, will allow for the best of both worlds, a high starting point with quick and monotonic convergence. And numerically, we can also see that this variant has a similar starting point as the exon dot Z, and also converges pretty quickly to an approximation ratio around 0.99. But then it also dips sharply soon after before finally converging again. And again, while this is definitely a strange observation, it's also a hopeful one, since it shows that it could in fact be possible to achieve high approximation ratios with relatively few variational parameters. Now, hopefully future work could identify why this happens and how to harness it. So that's pretty much the bulk of the results that I had. But before I finish, I want to summarize a few of the key takeaways. So first, we wanted to improve the classical optimization component of variational quantum algorithms by designing on Zatzi that would yield favorable optimization landscapes. And to provably do this, we wanted analytical forms of the class function. So we designed on Zatzi consisting of poly X operators. And from the setting, we found that while an exponentially parameterized on Zatzi yields a landscape free of local optimum over generic graphs, a polynomially sized on Zatzi would not be able to yield a super polynomial speed up over purely classical schemes, from which we conjectured that entanglement alone was not enough to provide a quantum advantage which led us to conclude that we needed both entanglement and non-commutativity in our ondots, which we tested and somewhat verified numerically by comparing various approximation ratios. And from this observation, what we would hope for in future work would be to use the classical X ondots, which doesn't have any non-commutative or entanglement creating elements, as a starting point for an adaptive ondots, like the recently introduced ones here. And I've heard many people disagree with me on this actually, but maybe one of these ondots can provably solve max cut efficiently. But also, maybe I'm being too optimistic on that. Um, but anyway, that's it for me. But as I mentioned during the talk, I've also included four extra slides on the relationship between the oracle and barren plateaus, the relationship to neural networks, the classical, purely classical algorithm that you can construct for theorem two, and also a proof outline of level one if people are interested, or I guess during the extra time later. But in any case, I want to thank you all again for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jun. Any questions? So if not, I have one. So actually regarding this, this strange dip um, in, in the plot you shown a couple of slides before, if you, if you could go back like two slides, I think. Right, could, it, could you turn up your volume a little bit? Down? Up, up. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. So okay. I wanted to say um, like two, could you, could you go back like two slides? This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, I was wondering um, regarding this strange behavior of this like QAOA starting from the zero state. Right. Do you have any clues about like what, what's happening there? Like, I, I know it's like not clear, but just like, do you have any thoughts or, or like theories about what's, what's there? Yeah, I mean, the starting point itself, I think is the intuition is that you know that the ground state is reachable if you start from the zero state, since like the on dot element basically flips the bits. But from the plus state, you can actually guarantee that after like only a few layers, you can actually reach the ground state. So this sort of initial with few variational parameters, it being higher with the zero state versus the plus state sort of makes sense intuitively. Now okay. why it dips after, I have no idea. <laughs> no idea, okay. And the, the other thing is, have you have you tried doing that with other optimizers than BFGS? Because maybe I, optimizers quirk or, or something like that? I don't know. I have not. We've actually just stuck with BFGS, but I definitely could try other ones. Maybe this is a feature of BFGS or not. Cool. OK, so if there are no other questions, if there are, please. Yeah, there is a question. Awesome. <clears throat> I was wondering, <clears throat> maybe in general and in particular, the role of ansatz, which was a major thing in your talk. So when, when do we have to invoke 
an ansatz. Why is it because we are in a narrow alley to explain something or to proceed? And what is the thinking about, because ansatz is very popular in physics, but right. can you maybe elaborate on that? Sorry, can you repeat your question? Like, what does that mean? Why do we invoke the concept of an ansatz or like? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> ansatz appears in different situations. Right. Okay. So maybe you can describe this situation because suppose tomorrow I'm stuck in some modeling or thinking and I need an answer. And why do I need it? And where do I find it? I mean, I can, in other words, the answers you have chosen can be alternative one to that? Yeah. The way that I'm thinking about this is you have sort of a basket of ansatzi. And if you look at these sort of adaptive ansatzi like algorithm that I mentioned at the last slide, they take this sort of basket of ansatzi they can choose from and they use sometimes machine learning, sometimes like a random approach to sort of select from the set of ansatzi that you know sort of perform in a certain way. So in our scenario, we chose this X ansatzi because you can easily analytically compute things from them. But the way I visualize is there's sort of like a basket you would have as sort of like things to choose from. Okay, I must stop the, the meeting here because we just ran out of time, but uh, please feel free to ask more questions maybe in the chat and maybe if our speakers can stay a little bit longer after the meeting to continue with some discussions. So thank you everyone for, for joining us in this QRST seminar. And as I said at the very beginning, we will update uh, the recordings of the talks and also the slides and the Zoom chat history in our YouTube channel and on our Twitter account. So thank you very much again. And thank you for the speakers for these very nice and uh, interesting uh, talks. And yes, see you in the next QRST everyone. <laughs>